Hello, it's Keith here, and this is a special episode to introduce a system I'm going to be adding to my 68000 series soon, and it's the Sinclair QL. Now, if this isn't really a system I ever knew about, it was certainly one that passed me by when I was young, and while I'd vaguely heard of it over the years more recently, it wasn't one I'd paid any attention to. However, I became more interested in it when I found out that it had a 68008 processor. Because, of course, I'm covering the 68000 in my tutorials, and the 68008 is a cut-down 68000 processor. So I started looking into the system, and it's actually quite a curious machine. It's quite strange. They've taken the kind of design plan from, like, the ZX81 and applied it to the 16-bit 68000 processor, and they've, they've ended up with this weird machine, which it was a horrendous commercial failure, basically, for three reasons. It was very late. There was uh, no software for it, and it used these micro cassettes called the Microdrive, I think it was, and apparently they were horrendously unreliable, partially for their own fault, because at the last minute they added TV out to it rather than just monitor out, and it was causing interference with their own cassette drives, so not a good plan there. But anyway, from our point of view, I think it's quite an interesting machine because it's essentially identical to the 68000. It's a slower processor, but from a programmer's point of view, it's identical, but it's a very basic machine from a sort of hardware point of view, so it's much more like the Z80 machines where we can just take control of the entire memory and switch the firmware off and things that maybe allows us to look at it from a different perspective to the other machines we're covering in the 68000 series. So today I'm going to have a quick talk through the machine, discuss some of the interesting things about it and give you a brief introduction to it in case you've not heard of it either. And then later on in my 68000 series when we get to the platform specific series we're going to be covering it just like we do for all the other machines. So here's a screenshot of the machine from Wikipedia. I don't actually own one, we'll just have to make do with emulators. And here is an emulator. This is the QLay 2 emulator. There's a whole series of QLay emulators, but this is the one I'm using. This allows me to use a folder on my machine, and I can just compile straight to that folder, and it appears as a drive, basically, within the operating system. And the operating system seems to be a bit more like the Enterprise operating system. It's actually quite advanced, relatively, compared to the Spectrum ones, so um, quite good there. Uh, the machine has eight colors on screen in this mode, and you can see I've drawn my Chibico sprite to the screen because my Acu sprite editor, the next release, Least will support the QL and also I've got my monitor dump in my usual font and I'm actually reading in keys input here so you can see I'm emulating my joystick control because maybe I'll be able to get Grime 68000 working on this one day. So let's get that out of the way and let's talk through the hardware of the machine. So, well, what is the spec of the machine? Well, I said it was a 68008. Now, this is a cut-down 68000. The 68000 has a 16-bit data bus, whereas the 68008 only has an 8-bit data bus. And this means that it takes twice as long to process the commands because the commands are all 16-bit, so it has to read them in two sections. But it's still quite fast. It's, it's, it's not slowed down to a Z80 or anything, but it's, a, it's apparently quite a bit slower. But anyway, that's not going to cause us any major problems in the kind of games we're writing. So a normal 68000 address bus would be 24 bits, the 68008 is only 20 bits and this has the effect of meaning that the memory limit of the machine is 1 megabyte whereas usually it would be 16. Now the machine comes with a minimum of 128k of memory which is quite a lot and it has 48k of ROM which is relatively little because of course the operating system is in the ROM. It has two screen modes available, 256 by 256 at 8 colour, although all those pixels may not be visible on a TV. And it has a 4 colour 512 by 256 mode as well, which of course is designed for word processing. And the colour options are, in 8 colour mode, it's got black, red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, yellow and white. And in 4 colour mode, slightly odd, it's got black, red, green and white. And you can't swap the colours around in the 4 colour mode, so you can't have red, green and blue rather than those colours. It's, it's fixed colours. It does have a sound chip, although the emulator I'm using doesn't support it, so we won't be hearing any sound today. But it's a two-channel sound chip, and it, it can apparently do some kind of distortions or effects. So I don't think it's anywhere near as good as the AY, but the, the QL was designed as a business machine, so I, I guess it's not that surprising, really. So as I said, the memory map of the machine allows for up to one megabyte of addressable memory, and you can see how it's split up here. Now, one important thing I have to explain is it does have a proper operating system, and the operating system will put different things in different positions depending on the amount of memory in the machine. So I've set it up with a 128K memory, the default memory, and then I've looked at the system settings and worked out what the default positions are, and I'm just going to discuss those here just for your curiosity. Now, firstly, it seems I can't spell the word screen there. I apologise for my typing there. But um, you can see here, so that the, the ROM takes up the first 48 kilobytes of memory. Then there's 16 kilobytes, which can be used by a cartridge. I've not tried anything with that. 
There are then some memory map registers here for various devices, but not very useful ones. Although we've got the ability to redefine the screen resolution here, the other things like accessing the keyboard have to be done by an I.O. chip, so we have to use the traps for that. There's no way of doing it directly, so that is a limitation. The machine doesn't have any joysticks either, which is rather annoying. But anyway, as I say, it, was, it wasn't designed as a games machine. So it's hexadecimal 20,000. We have the basic screen. Now that's the one you would see as you load the machine up. There is an option for a second screen buffer and you can do hardware page flipping. However, in typical Sinclair style, they've applied all the system variables to the second screen buffer and you can't move the screen system variables without turning the operating system off, which you can do. But as I say, you're not going to be able to use that second screen and use the firmware at the same time. So if we want to use that second screen buffer, we're going to have to move those system variables out the way or just delete them and then reuse the operating system again. Now, this is where things get a bit unpredictable. Essentially, when you load a program into memory, it allocates the topmost memory address first. So if you've got 128K and in my example, I allocated 32K, that would start at 38 triple zero and go all the way up to 40,000 here. But if you had 256K, it would be much higher up. So as I say, things like these, the exact position of the stack pointer, the system variables and the heap and these free areas and the user stack pointer things, these will move around. But the, this is an example based on the emulator I'm running. You can pull the system variables to see where the stack pointer and things are. But I just wanted to give you some kind of feeling for what the layout you might see of the system is because one of the things we can do with this QL machine is we can turn the firmware off and we can wipe all the memory and do whatever we want with it so and we don't have to worry about you know doing any real harm because you know it's only going to affect the RAM so and then after that we've got add-on RAM add-on peripherals and extra add-on ROM here and of course the address space only goes up to one megabyte so five F's here now all of the access to the operating system and the hardware access and the extra hardware chips has to be done through traps. There are essentially five traps. Zero, which will turn the processor into supervisor mode, and we need to do that if we want to take over the all of the memory and flush out the operating system. We've got QDOS manager here, simple I.O., advanced I.O., and basic, as in the basic operating system that you see there in the machine starts up. Because by default, when the machine starts up, you'll see this mode here, and you can see here we have our standard um, basic kind of thing. And so we can do things like that. And also, quite curiously, if we reset it, the machine was designed to work with a monitor or a TV. So if we turn the monitor on, we've now got a high resolution mode. And we can now have one side for our programming and the other side for our view. Very strange, but anyway. So yeah, that 48K operating system has obviously given it a big boost over the um, spectrum and things, but it did cause the machine to be late. So there we go. I've got a very brief description of all the traps here. I just got these out of the reference manual and put them in a list just to help me out, really. Uh, if you want to work out exactly where your system parameters are, as I said, a lot of these options are not guaranteed to be in the same position. I did write the documentation of how to do that there. You can use this this trap here to get those system parameters. And then the system parameters will be re returned in the format of a um, table of variables in this format here. The screen layout, as I say, there's two screen modes. You can change them by writing to port 18063, a memory map port, and it's bit three that changes the resolution. Now, in four color mode, then you have a red bit and a green bit. And of course, if you set both, you get white. In the eight color mode, you've got four bits of each byte that are doing the red, four bits of the byte that are doing the blue, four bits of the opposite byte in the word doing the green, and four bits for flashing, which I'm not actually sure if the emulator I'm using supports those. I've not really tried it, but it didn't seem to work when I was experimenting with it. But maybe I'm not using it right. Now, if we want to do things like sound, which my emulator doesn't support, or the keyboard, then we do actually have to uh, use the traps. So it's quite a pain, unfortunately. You have to send a command in a series of bytes in this kind of format here. And so in this example here, this is the command. We're using trap one. We have to set D0 to hexadecimal 11, which is 17, I believe. And we have to load the pointer. This should be key command here. This should say key command here. That's a mistake. Um, it, so we have to load the pointer to key command into A3, call the trap, and then in D1, it will return the bit mask of the row we selected. And the row we select is specified in byte six here. So that's how we do it. And then the map of the keys is in this format here. So if we've returned one here, which gives this line here. And the reason I did this is so I could emulate a joystick because I'm hoping to port Grime 68000 to it at some point. 
So anyway, that's just a very brief introduction to this system. It'll be covered more in my tutorials later. I just really wanted to sort of introduce it and see what people thought because, as I say, I, I kind of hadn't even paid any attention to it. I wouldn't have even recognised the name, to be honest, so maybe other people are interested in it as well. Anyway, let me know what you think, and if you want to see more of the QL, like and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching today, and goodbye.